Let's go. I got a lot of things to say, not a lot of time. Uh, first thing is how many people would consider themselves to be 90s kids? Like, I, yes, okay, 90s kids in the house. I grew up uh, in the 90s, born in the late 80s, but I definitely identify as a 90s kid. And I'm curious if your experience was anything like mine, because to me, there were kind of two types of kids in the 80s, or in the 90s, and there were the nice, clean, Disney kids, and then there were the Nickelodeon, slimy, weirdo uh, kids, and you can just guess which one I identified as. Um, I was definitely a Nickelodeon kid, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure I got that weird, slimy creativeness from uh, my mom, who was not Wolverine, I'm going to explain what that, that is all about. Um, but uh, growing up, all the people in my life were just constantly telling me that I was just like my mom. And I thought that was the best thing ever because she was the coolest person in the world. One time she drew this amazing, like picture-perfect Wolverine and Sharpie on my X-Men trading card binder. And I was like this is the best, and I showed it to all my friends, and they're like, your mom is so freaking cool, and I was like, yeah, and the word on the street is that I'm just like her, so, I mean, draw, draw your own conclusions there. Um, but you know, as I got older, that relationship to being like my mom kind of became more complicated, as it does for, for some folks. Um, you know, when I was like, uh, you know, she left me with my dad when I was a toddler, so I didn't get to see her as much as I wanted to see her. And by the time I was 13, she l left her second family and kind of just disappeared for a little bit. We didn't really know where she was most of the time. Um, and I just started to kind of pick up from these same people that told me that I was just like her, that m they didn't have maybe the highest opinion of her. And so maybe it wasn't a compliment <laughs> what they were saying because they would say stuff like, you know, your mom, she just can't stick to anything. She can't stick to an appointment, can't stick to a man, can't stick to a job. She treats employment like it's jail. Like, I was like, huh, I don't know if I like being like my mom anymore. Um, and then when I was 17, my Aunt Sandy, who is her twin sister, um, called me and was like, hey, I know we haven't seen your mom in a while, but uh, we just found out that she's in the hospital and she's undergoing emergency brain surgery. And uh, we found out that her boyfriend was really abusive and she's like, she's been having all these seizures, but she hasn't taken her medicine because it affects her high. And I was like, what high? What are you? What are you talking about? And she's like, "Oh, um, your your mom's like uh, really addicted to um, drugs and hardcore drugs." And I remember like going and seeing her when she got out, and it was totally as brutal as you can imagine to see someone that you love this much kind of lose who they were. Uh, but on top of all that, were those three words of this is you, like you're just like this person. This is what the world has in store for creative, slimy weirdos. Um, this is the path. And it was a really dark time. And uh, I just remember at some point feeling like I am going to be the opposite of my mom. I'm going to stick to things, and I'm going to be a success, and I'm not going to end up like her. And, you know, so I was like, all right, I'm going to get a job. I got a job at the movie theater because I love movies. Uh, I love watching movies. Come to find out that has nothing to do with the job. There's no <laughs> watching movies. And instead, they just like brought me to this little box that was about the size of this podium, I think. And they're like, hey, just stand here for the next eight to 10 hours and do math. And I was like, 
Okay, huh. Feels kind of like a jail cell. Oh no, <laughs> just like my mom. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I was just, I, I was in a really dark place, but then in tandem with that, something that feels inconsequential happened, but ended up being a big deal, I discovered like indie music and Modest Mouse and Death Cab and Bright Eyes and all that kind of stuff. And I love the music, but even more, I was obsessed with the merch, the band posters, and the screen printed, uh, screen printed band pro, the screen printed band posters. And uh, you know, now I know that it's the the tasteful use of negative space and gestalt principles are just making these things come alive. At the time, I didn't know any of that. I just was like, this is super cool, and it looks kind of like this is a job. To, to do this. Uh, I feel like this is the kind of job that maybe I could succeed in. And so I went to school for design and illustration and I could see like a big part of succeeding in this world is having a style. And I was like, all right, I went to school. I told my teachers like, hey, while I'm here, I really need to find a style. That seems to matter. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this in creative spaces, but I was met with this kind of overly mystical approach to creativity, um, kind of like a stoner Yoda vibe. Um, and it was like, uh, I was like, I gotta find my style, man. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down there. You don't just find your style. Your style finds you, <laughs> if you're lucky. And I was like, I'm going to college for this, man. <laughs> I'm, there's a lot riding on this. I need to, I need to make this happen. Uh, and they were like, look, you know, uh, you, you can have a style, but it, you don't just go find it. It's like something that comes from inside. You have to find yourself first. And I was like, that's the opposite of what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I'm trying to lose myself. I try to get away from this thing. Like, I do not want to cultivate whatever this is. Uh, and so I just honestly ignored them. And, uh, and I just adopted this, the, a trendy style. You know, at this time, this is about 2007, 2008, and this psychedelic doodle movement thing was happening. And I can look at this stuff now and kind of feel like, I see some authentic things going on there, and, I, and there are things that I like about it, but I would be lying to you if I said that this is this authentic style. It was just kind of doing the trendy thing um, from the moment. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I did this. I ended up publishing this book right out of school. I, it worked for me for a little bit, started getting some jobs, getting some freelance work, and just like, a year out of college, this company got in contact with me to do some illustration to be animated uh, on a show on Nickelodeon. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I just started the game and I'm already at the final boss. <laughs> like, this is, like, what is happening? This is amazing. And, uh, and, and I was like, oh man, okay, I gotta do. And actually, they wanted me to make illustration to be animated into a music video for the Decemberists, which was one of my favorite indie bands. And I was like, this, this is the best thing that ever happened. So I gave it everything I had. I was trying every trick in my book, every trick up my sleeve, uh, you know, like the, that thing. I was like that, except I didn't have that many tricks up my sleeve because I'd only been doing it for a little bit of time. And so I had just like one tissue up my sleeve, um, which you might not know this, that's not magic. That's, <laughs> that's just disgusting. <laughs> Grandparents, if you're here, stop it. You're frightening the children. But throw your Kleenex in the trash. Um, any, anyway, uh, but I was like, all right made my little illustrations, sent them over, and just like braced myself, uh, and um, waited to hear back, and they sent me an email, and this is what they said about my final illustrations. They said, rough drafts look okay. 
looking forward to seeing how they shape up in the finals. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, and, I, and actually, um, if you didn't catch it, those were my finals. <laughs> and you also, if you didn't catch, like, I had used every trick that I had. I couldn't think of anything else that I could do to improve it. Um, this is it. I used to not show this because I freaking hate it. Um, <laughs> this little tangent alone is enough to just make you vomit. Um, <laughs> But sorry about that. Um, but uh, so um, so anyway, uh, I couldn't think of what to do other than just to be like, um, those are the finals. Yeah. Suffice it to say, they were not pleased with that answer. And to make matters worse, uh, that whole psychedelic doodle movement kind of just dried up for the most part. And for like six months, I didn't get any work. And we ended up having like bill collectors call us and we were in a really uh, shitty time. And, um, and I couldn't even find a creative adjacent job. And so I just had to get whatever job I could find. And I ended up getting this role at a youth shelter slash detention center for uh, teenagers, juvenile detention. And I remember like the first day that I had to do a shift in the juvie and I'm like walking back in this locked down facility. Uh, you know, the, the kids in here are like two years younger than me. And I'm like shaking from anxiety of the proposition of being like locked in this place that doesn't have any windows for like 10 hours and every other person that worked there was like twice my age and twice my size and I'm just like this little helpless squishy emo artist and uh, I'm just like oh man um, how did this happen like just a couple months ago I was like I had tasted my dream job and now I'm in my nightmare like everything that I had done since I was a teenager was to avoid traditional employment because it felt like a jail to ending up in traditional employment in a jail for teenagers. I was <laughs> just like, what is my life? Why, what happened? And I was actually really depressed. And I was like, I would come home and like, lay face down on the living room floor, and just like go to sleep, to just like block it out. And um, then I got an email from a guy who was an illustrator and designer named Andrew Nyer, really super talented dude, who was running a gallery in Cincinnati. And he had seen my coloring book and he was like, hey, I would love to take this concept to the gallery. Like maybe we could do a collaborative black and white mural and have people come in and color it uh, in real time. And I was kind of nervous to like open my heart up again to the creative path because it just broke me. Um, but I was like, all right, I don't have anything to lose. Let's, let's do it. And the night before I was going to go to Cincinnati, he sent me a, or he, he called me and he's like, hey, there's something wrong with the show. And I was like, oh, not again. Yeah, I'm going to get my heart broke. Um, and he's like, no, uh, the show's great. I love the concept. It's just kind of incomplete because we're doing this giant wall, and it's kind of like a giant-sized coloring book. We can't have people color it in with, like, regular-sized markers. That doesn't make any sense. And I was like, if you know Rick Moranis and... <laughs> have some kind of reverse shrink ray thing or a, no, a creative wizard maybe. I don't know. I'm down. I'm cool with giant markers. He's like, oh, no, don't worry about it. They'll be there. Um, I just flipped through a bunch of them, huh? Um, damn it. Um, uh, <laughs> so you know. Uh, but I, I was like, okay, you know, whatever. And I hung up. Um, he's like, he told me they would be there the next day. And I thought, they definitely will not you're going to find out you don't just whip up some giant markers overnight. And as you saw, when I got there, 
He was there and so were the markers. These giant, freaking amazing markers. And we did the show, it was incredible. And the markers were incredible, but even more than the show, it was just the experience of hanging out with this dude who was a creative wizard. Uh, that's him dressed as a wizard in front, of his, uh, in front of his gallery for a different show. He just had all these crazy projects and just like jamming on the walls with him. I just felt like, man, this guy has so much more a sense of who he is and he's confident in it and he knows what he's capable of. And I kind of saw a little bit of myself in him. And I thought, maybe that part of me isn't so bad. And maybe I can kind of own that part. And I am very grateful to the universe because I don't think I would have even saw it because he was so far ahead of me, except for the universe gave me a really good clue. And I think the only reason I could see that he was kind of like a more mature, professional, confident version of me was because his name is Andrew. I don't know if you know this. Andrew's like the mature, professional version of the name Andy. That's me. And I was like, I remember flying home on the highway and I called my wife and I was like, okay, I know everything sucks right now, but I'm like feeling pumped and I just feel like it's gonna work out. I met the future me, he's super professional, it's gonna be fine. Um, <laughs> And honestly, I'm really uh, super excited about being here doing this talk because, you know, I went home and I was like, I need more of this energy. I need to find more people like this. And the one of the places that I got the most creative fuel from was actually Creative Mornings. And... Uh, I just, like, binged so many talks. I remember... Uh, this one from Aaron Draplin. Um, I'm a big Draplin fan. And I remember seeing this guy from the Midwest owning that part of himself and thinking, I've never seen an artist do that. And I thought, huh, maybe that part of me is also not so bad, and maybe I can kind of own that. And I remember seeing Kate Bingham and Burt, and she did this crazy project where uh, she did it, made a daily project out of drawing her credit card debt statements. And I was like, man, okay, maybe being terrible with numbers and money isn't the worst thing. Like, she owned it in a really big way. Uh, maybe I can own that too. And so I just started doing this daily project where I was doing a new character every weekday for a year. And uh, I just felt like, every single one of these pieces was kind of like a self-exploration. And I feel like everybody knows that creative work is a self-expression, but at the start, I feel like it's as much, uh, it's way less about making creative gold, and the work you're making is more like just a creative shovel. And it's just not, it's self-expression, but it's also self-excavation. It's just like digging into yourself and trying to figure out who am I? What do I like? What, why am I drawn to these things? What is this about? And that's what this project was. Now, at some point, I'd watched almost all the talks that I'd wanted to watch, and I was running out of creative fuel, and I had to turn to some of the ones that I was avoiding watching. One of those was this guy, Joseph Wu, and it's not, I don't have anything against origami. I thought that was super cool. It was just that in the title of the talk, uh, it was origami, depression, and ADHD. And I kind of uh, had always felt like maybe I had ADHD, but I really just kind of ignored it. And I remember like even in first grade, there was this kid uh, named Jeremy, of course, his name was Jeremy. It just sounds right. Um, there's a, Jeremy past first grade, actually. Um, not make the, never mind. Um, 
But uh, there was this kid named Jeremy, he was the only kid that like could keep up with my energy and absurdity and we'd be running around an open gym and it was awesome and I was like, this guy's awesome. And then one time he had to stop and he's like, hey, I gotta go get my medicine. And I was like, oh, are you sick? And he's like, no, I'm just hyper. And I was like, oh, I thought that was just called being awesome. I didn't, I didn't know you needed medicine for that. And then I remember in high school, um, I, me, this was like kind of my darker period, and I was self-destructing, kind of doing most drugs that I could get my hands on, and me and my buddy got some uh, Adderall from a girl that had ADHD, and we both did it, and we both separately did really crazy things that night. So... My friend stayed up all night, didn't sleep a wink on a school night, watched the sunrise like totally wired, and I did something way crazier than that, my homework. <laughs> you haven't even found that I did it in an efficient manner. And I was like, huh, that's a pretty bizarre way to party, but okay, okay. <laughs> And I thought, what's that all about? But I couldn't exactly go tell my parents, like, hey, I think I have ADHD. And they're like, why? Why do you think that? And like, uh, illegal activities. Um, <laughs> um, and so I just kind of ignored it until this talk. And I'm watching this talk, and everything he's saying is just like, I can't ignore. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm... I watch the talk and then I just go binge, doom scroll, everything I can find about ADHD. And I'm feeling like uh, if this is a diagnosis, there is no not being this. And, you know, it said like, has trouble sticking with things, has trouble making appointments, has trouble uh, in relationships, has trouble staying at a job. And if you have it, you probably got it from one of your parents because it has a really strong genetic uh, uh, piece to it. And I didn't think much to know which parent I got it from. But uh, as I was reading about it, I felt like um, that I was getting to know my mom in a way that I'd never seen before because I realized like everything that she had tried to do wasn't her. You know, she tried to be a regular waitress, or a regular secretary, a regular type of stay-at-home mom. And like these were the things on the list of like not ADHD friendly things. And I thought, you know, she only ever failed at what she wasn't. And so in a way, she wasn't a failure because she'd never failed at being herself. Uh, and I started to just wonder if who she was wasn't a problem and maybe it wasn't a problem to uh, be like her. And I think I also just started to wonder what would happen if I quit trying to be the opposite of my mom and instead tried to be more like her than she ever even let herself be. And, uh, you know, as I'm going through all that, we get a call to take the Color Me show to New York City, and we, we uh, jump at the opportunity, and we go meet all these amazing artists and visit their studios, and we even went to this studio, and met this person. I don't know if anybody, anybody know who this is? This is Tina Roth Eisenberg, and I owe a lot to her because she is the uh, creator of Creative Mornings. And um, it was, you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting so emotional. I haven't really talked, I've talked about ADHD, you know, on my podcast, and I've talked about it here and there, but I've, this is the first, like, talk that I've done about it. Um, anyway, so uh, she's uh, an amazing creative weirdo and very inspirational. Um, but I also met some people that came to the show that really 
piqued my interest because they worked at a company, probably one that you've heard of at least a few times in this talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, they worked at Nickelodeon. And I was like, oh, interesting. And it's just crazy that I went home and right at the same time that I was ready to go talk to my doctor about this journey to get a diagnosis of ADHD, uh, that these people emailed me and were like, hey, we'd love for you to produce some illustration to be animated on our channel. And uh, I was like, I'm back at Bowser. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's the final boss. It's the same client that nearly destroyed me. And uh, it's the same client, but I really did have a sense that I wasn't the same person. You know, I had learned a lot with the tools, making all this work and from these inspirations, and I had really learned a lot about myself. And I felt like I'm a, I'm a different, I'm, I'm, I'm not the same, but I'm not a different person. I'm really more me than I've ever been. And I just gave this thing everything I had, except this time I had at least more than one tissue, up, one trick up the sleeve. And I just gave it all I had, and I sent these final illustrations over and just braced myself for heartbreak. And um, you know what they said about my final illustrations? They said, we love them. We love them so much, can we do it again? And then they wanted to do it again and again. And I did like 15 projects with Nickelodeon and they became my biggest repeat client. And the reason I could go full-time freelance illustra in illustration and, uh, and the reason I've just got to do so many you know, incredible things since then. And the reason why I tell this story is because, um, you know, whatever you do, whether you think of yourself as an artist or a creator, or maybe you're not even there yet, whatever work you do is a reflection of who you are. It is a type of self-expression. And in my journey to make that self-expression and make that art, I just realized that you're never gonna love the work if you hate yourself. Um, and so I think that, you know, loving yourself and uh, thinking of yourself this way is the start of making great work. And I hope that this silly story helps nudge you into where I'm at uh, in, in my belief about people because I really don't believe that people, I don't believe that you are something to overcome or something to repress or something to get around. I really think that you are something to cultivate because that's what you do to good things. And I believe that people are good things and I believe that you are a good thing. And, um, Thanks.